Marhaba, and welcome back. This is uh, Jack Dempsey, American writer and historian, talking with Muhammad Jihad Ishmael, a writer and historian, a uh, Palestinian writer and historian living in Gaza. We were broken off in our contact, what we're calling now part one, about the issues of ancient and modern Gaza archaeology. It's uh, an invaluable Western heritage that needs to be protected and nurtured and saved. And we're trying to, well, raise awareness about that. So we really thank you for your patience and coming back to us. When we were so rudely interrupted, Muhammad was talking about the recent new discoveries at a tell or hilltop there in Gaza beside the sea. Muhammad, what's the name of the place and what kinds of finds did they make there? The tell name is uh, Tal Al Udul, and Udul in the Arabic language mean the oxen. Mean the oxen. Okay. Yeah. Hill, hill of the oxen. Yes, exactly. This is the the translation of the the name. Now this is our third attempt to make this discussion about this wonderful news. And in the earlier one, we were noting that in keeping with all the archaeology of Gaza and Palestine, it's an incredibly eclectic and multicultural society that was thriving there. So these finds in the tell, what age do they come back, take us back to? And what were the, what were the civilizations involved there? What evidences did they find of many cultures there? The excavations, Tel Al-Udul, dates back to the Middle Bronze Age. Uh, so we speak about 2,000 and uh, 300, 2,400 BC. Uh, of course, we, sp we speak about the Canaanite, the Canaanite era. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this tell, uh, Tel Al-Udul, uh, is witnessing the uh, incredible uh, melting uh, of the Canaanites, uh, the Canaanites with the people of the sea. How uh, this this uh, this tell is showing us how mm -hmm. those two peoples uh, used to melt with each other, to mix with each other, and how they lived uh, friendly uh, 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 with each other. They uh, used to marry. Uh, from each other and mm -hmm. to have blood and to have uh, and to have a blood relationship between uh, uh, them. So in this tell, Tel Al Udul, uh, the Swedish uh, archaeological team uh, have found so many uh, evidences shows us uh, this special relation between the Canaanites and people of the sea after they. Uh, lived or after they reached the uh, uh, coast of Gaza. Uh, and by people, uh, by people of the sea, the people we are talking about are from usually the Aegean Sea, the islands that we now call the Greek islands, the Greek mainland, which was then Mycenaean, the uh, people from Cyprus, some people from Egypt, some people from uh, the native indigenous population of the Canaanites, that they had long, long mixed together through their long ancient trade, even before the period of tumult, which was called the period of the people of the sea. So they had long been intermarried and interrelated and doing business between the Mediterranean and the spice roads to the east. What else did they find there, Muhammad? And have you seen any of these things or what more have you heard about it? Yes, brother. Uh... Let me uh, let me tell you more about the excavations in yes. Tel Al Udul. After that, I will tell you uh, something more about the commercial uh, uh, importance of Gaza in the ancient world. Uh, uh, in the excavations, they found so many potteries, ornaments, uh, gold, uh, jewelry. Uh, uh, Amphoras uh, containing some wine, some grains, we, uh, wheat, uh, etc., raisin. All of these amphoras uh, used to come to uh, Gaza shore, of course, by sea, by, by ships, whether from uh, Cyprus or from Crete or from the uh, other uh, 
e, e, Greek islands. Uh, yeah. uh, now uh, I will tell you about, of course, uh, this relationship between uh, Canaanites and people of the sea was uh, in the fall of the Bronze Age and in the beginning of Iron Age. So mm -hmm. we speak about uh, something like between uh, 15 uh, centuries uh, until uh, 9th centuries uh, BC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, I have to tell you something important, of course, also uh, showing the relationship between Gaza and the Asian inland. Uh, the, the the Arabian uh, Sahara, the Arabian Desert, the, the Arabian state, the, the, the Arabian states uh, in the Asian inland. I have to tell you that in the second and in the first uh, centuries uh, BC, Gaza was the main port for the skin road. The skin road, you know? The, yeah, the Silk uh, Road. The yeah, spice, yeah. the the spice yeah. road. It has many names, exactly. but it's it's the road to the Far yeah. East. And in a city called Gath, about twenty miles inland from Gaza, uh, uh, Aaron Mayer, a tremendous Israeli archaeologist, they found cinnamon and nutmeg being burned in the temples. And the only place you could get cinnamon and nutmeg from those temples in that time was from Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. This is the exactly. farthest trading reach toward the east that had ever been recorded at that time. So the Palestinians, even then, were incredibly astute and able business people, enabling all kinds of trade among all kinds of countries. Exactly, exactly. In the, in the second and in the first centuries BC, Gaza was the main port for the Nabatean, the Nabatean civilization. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this uh, civilization, uh, has flourished in the uh, in the known today as Jordan and in the and in the northern part of Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. uh, Nabatians uh, used to rely totally on Gaza uh, as their naval route to the uh, European ports. Through this route, they used to export the dates, the Arabian perfumes. Uh, the uh, the plants and wood of Yemen. Uh, you know, in that time, Yemen uh, was very, very uh, fertile land. Yes. So, uh, we, yeah. So we have so many spices and uh, some kinds of uh, some fine kinds of wood. Also, uh, uh, was coming through the camel uh, caravans. Yes. Through desert. Uh, until they reach Gaza port, the, the Minua, and from Gaza Minua, uh, uh, ships used to carry uh, th those uh, 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 wares to uh, uh, Europe. Yes, and you can see why Gaza would be such a wealthy community among the archaeology that I've read about the place. It was a thriving and very wealthy community because most seagoing cultures are. They thrive on international trade and they can make the most of exchange rates or however you want to look at it. Now, there are two other important bits of news about Gaza archaeology that I'd like to ask you about. One is in 2008, a private rescue, a privately funded rescue team created the Gaza Museum of Archaeology. It's called Al Mahaf in Gaza City. And this is a place that covers, well, from the Chalcolithic to the Neolithic to the Bronze Age to the Greek to the Roman to the Byzantine to the Crusaders. And the second development is just last year that other archaeologists have discovered a complete Roman cemetery, 51 graves so far, and uh, a fabulous floor of a house, a mosaic floor that was almost intact there. And at the sites, at the websites that we've referred you to, Al Monitor and ForensicArchitecture.org, you can see photos of these things. Now, I bring these up, Muhammad, to ask you, we were just beginning to discuss in our second attempt at this program, the tremendous possibilities and potential of the history of Gaza to bring and attract tourists, scholars, historians, scientists, 
who are trying to piece together an ever receding, ever more rich ancient history of the Gaza territory. And if Gaza were to be opened again, it would have that uh, tremendous economic potential as a resource for the Palestinian people to begin to thrive again the way they always have. Uh, uh, brother, uh, 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 we have to make uh, a comparison between Gaza nowadays and Gaza in the ancient times. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, it, it's uh, a dark uh, and a melancholy uh, comparison but because Gaza in the ancient times was a cosmopolitan city. In Gaza, Always. Uh, you, yes, 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 uh, for sure. In Gaza, uh, you can find the Greek uh, people, uh, the Egyptians, the Arabian who Canaanite. come from the who come from Sahara. Yep. You can find the Syrian, the Phoenician, uh, the Mesopotamian, even the Hittit who come from Turkey, from yes. from Minor Asia, from Minor yes. Asia. Yes. Uh, yeah, 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 brother. Yes, brother. So Gaza in that time was a cosmopolitan city and was opened uh, on all the world and was of course a commercial uh, route uh, flowing with goods and uh, all yes. the time uh, we have ships uh, are moving from Gaza Minoa, Gaza port, Gaza seaport to all the uh, uh, parts of the world. But now, and, on contrary, on contrary, unfortunately, Gaza is like uh, a coffin, like 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 a tomb. Gaza is 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 totally closed and sieged. Uh, I think you know very well how uh, how we live here in this uh, in this uh, in this cage, you know. And that's what we it are is. Prisoners. A cage. We are, we are totally prisoners. Yes. What? A, a prison of two point five million people who never get enough to yeah. eat, who never get right drinking water or medicines or allowed to do their business with the rest of the world. In, con uh, brother, in, in, in what you're saying, Mohammed, the, the contrast between the ancient heritage of Gaza with its cosmopolitan, constantly cosmopolitan civilization, and now is also featured in what Hamas censors from the Gaza uh, Museum of Archaeology. I've been reading online about this, and one of the finds was a Greek statue of Aphrodite, the goddess of beauty uh, and erotic feeling. There is a statue of her that is not allowed to be shown there. They also do not allow to be shown any images of other gods than the biblical one, and there those are forbidden, so there's nothing. There is an oil lamp menorah of Jewish origin in Gaza, that they will not allow to be shown. And in 2017, they destroyed Tel Es Sahan, south of Gaza City, a site from the Bronze Age. Now this had to do with land mismanagement as we often see in Greece too. Somebody in the a farmer uncovers a gorgeous mosaic or other pieces of ancient evidence. And the laws supposedly must preserve and give preserve that site and give the farmer other land to compensate him or her. So they take the land legally, but they do not compensate. And so as in Crete here, the, the incentive is to hide what you have found, to cover it up and try to protect it until a more enlightened day appertains, I suppose. But in Greece, they say to a farmer, okay, you know about where the ancient Minoan house is? Then give us all the gold you have already stolen from inside or you are going to prison. So why would any person report what they have found? How can knowledge go forth with such gross mismanagement and small-mindedness? Uh, let me tell you frankly and clearly that all the antiquities that are found uh, recently in Gaza uh, are worthless, are uh, meaningless. Uh, their value is not, is not something uh, big because uh, during the recent uh, uh, three uh, centuries, uh, Gaza was excavated uh, 
very well. All, all the parts of Gaza territory was excavated, whether by uh, the uh, European uh, excavation teams or by the Egyptians during the Egyptian administration uh, for Gaza. Mm -hmm. And as I, as I mentioned previously, unfortunately, uh, we can say that uh, most of the important and valuable uh, antiquities of Gaza are stolen, and now they are uh, shown in the uh, museums of London, uh, Istanbul, and uh, Tel Aviv. Let me, let me, uh, but but this need uh, an entire uh, episode to talk. Let me uh, in, in the coming episode to uh, to tell you about the special relation between Moshe Dayan and the antiquities of Gaza. I will tell you. Uh, so amazing facts and information about this relation. Uh, in do. fact, this man, yeah, yeah, this man uh, wasn't only uh, a military colonel, but uh, uh, beside that, he was an archaeologist and he was fund in archaeology. Mm. I will tell you with details how he used to steal uh, most of the valuable and important uh, antiquities of Gaza. Here in Gaza, we have uh, uh, ancient Egyptian uh, antiquities. Dates back to the uh, uh, early Bronze Age. Mm. But all of these antiquities were stolen by Moshe Dayan. You know? So uh, now in Gaza, we haven't only uh, one private uh, museum. No, I think. According to my information, I think we have three or four uh, uh, private uh, museums. They were uh, established by uh, normal persons, not by NGOs, not by government. Uh, so, uh, and of course, I used to visit them. I visited them all. Uh, as I told you, of course, they, uh, they contain some antiquities, but as I told you, uh, they are uh, uh, marginal antiquities, not original, not uh, not uh, prominent according to their uh, yes. history, according to their archaeological uh, value. Yes. So as I told you, unfortunately, most of the prominent uh, antiquities uh, were uh, already stolen from Gaza by the uh, Ottoman uh, occupation, by the British mandate, and by the Israeli occupation. And so besides the hiding, which comes as a dysfunction of the laws protecting archaeological sites, besides the stealing, which always go on in imperial occupations, there are also damages now to archaeological sites in the Gaza territory due to the wars, due to the battles between Gaza's Hamas and the Israeli military. We referred people earlier to a website called Forensic architecture.org, forensicarchitecture.org. This is a subtitle, Living Archaeology in Gaza. There are beautiful photographs there, but they also have a forensic purpose in mind, and that is to aerially photograph important archaeological sites in the Gaza territory that have been struck by bombs and missiles and rockets and completely thereby archaeologically destroyed. This is a process and a part of a process of the erasure and silencing of Palestinian history and cultural presence now. So while we're sitting here talking about Gaza's immense potential down the centuries and millennia to attract people as a new center of learning and science and history and archaeology in every way, there is also this programmatic destruction going on that goes right back to Bible times. So if you want to compare the visibility, ancient-wise, of the Israelite people with the Palestinian people, it's no contest. There is nothing, and this is, I'm quoting Israeli archaeologists, to demonstrate almost anything that the Bible claims as history. Whereas we can see and feel and touch in our hands the many archaeological remains that go back to the Stone Age in Gaza and in Palestinian history. The Palestinian <laughs> people today are the inheritors 
of this great human legacy. It belongs to them and it tells them who they are. Muhammad, let me try to stop talking and ask you a question that how valuable you feel all this is to your identity as a Palestinian person, the, how valuable it is to your community, to your people in all of the different parts of the Palestinian diaspora now. Can you talk a little yes, about how people feel about that legacy now? Yes, brother. Uh, in fact, I have a very, uh, very big uh, self-confidence. And this self-confidence is coming from my being as indigenous. In fact, I am indigenous. I am living here in this land. And my ancestors are dating back. I'm not hearing you. Uh, okay, uh, so, you're back. Yes. Yeah, so as I told you, uh, 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 my, my ancestors are from this land, and this gives me uh, a powerful self-confidence. Yeah, uh, I think that, I think that, uh, our Palestinians who are living now in the diaspora from Chile in Southern America until, uh, until uh, the far Asia, all of them are feeling like me that they, that they are, that they were uh, uprooted from their uh, land, uh, the land of their ancestors. In fact, all of us are, are, are indigenous. We are, uh, we are related uh, for, uh, to, uh, to this land. You know, brother. So, uh, as I told you, this give me uh, comfort in my life and give me high high spirit that I uh, I should fight to uh, to a better life for my children, uh, to uh, to uh, to provide them a peaceful life. And I uh, insist to tell you again and again that I never uh, have have any thoughts before uh, that I should expel the Israelis and I should uh, sweep them and kick them to the Mediterranean. No, I, uh, I think I can live with him side by side in, uh, in the same place. I think we can live and we can melt. We can melt with each other exactly like how our ancestors used to melt with their uh, and sisters, you know uh, yes. very very well that 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 in our uh, village, just before the Nakba, the catastrophe of 1948, our uh, 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 village uh, was a home for all the religions, for the Christian, the Jew, the Muslim, the Durzi, etc. All of them used to live in harmony. And that is the spirit, the, that, that is the eclectic ancient spirit of the Palestinians that people need so much to understand that this is in its very nature an eclectic, open-sided civilization that thrives on contact, on new things, on people mingling together. And that is the exact opposite of the Zionist mission. They are separate there is only their community that matters and everybody else is in the way of their dream. This goes back to the Bible I read in a earlier, in I think it was in part one, from the Book of Wisdom. The Book of Wisdom, chapter 12, verses 3 to 11. Look that up where it says we are going to destroy these indigenous people bit by bit. They are horrible, evil, dark, violent ghastly people, every cliche of caricature you could imagine is used in there. And that passage is not an allegory. It's not a symbolic statement that tells us about the community of God somehow or the kingdom of heaven. It's a racist demand, they say, from their God, but it actually, of course, comes from human beings that we will exterminate silence and erase these people. And it must be, Muhammad, such a difficult legacy to carry because you know in your family's very history 
that there was mostly peace between all these peoples at one time within the memory of your family. And now everyone is being told that this is an impossible and ancient conflict that can only be resolved with one victory side, one side's victory over the other. It must be a very difficult legacy to know in your heart the truth of people being able to get along and live together while being told and being forced to believe by violence that it has to be this bad. Yes, brother. Uh, I will tell you my opinion uh, in this point just briefly. And I think after that we have to uh, finish because I am afraid from from my uh, uh, internet. <laughs> this uh, is our yeah. third try today, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Brother, let me tell you that the Zionist project is something uh, selfish and something uh, unethical and is something against the human nature. The human nature, Bravo. which we had, which we had in Palestine before the Nakba of uh, 1948, uh, as I told you, was showing you the, the natural image uh, of the human beings who are living as neighbors, as friends, even uh, even as 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 a family. You know, uh, the Jew, the Muslim, the Christian, the Durzi. All of them used to live in one place in, yes. in, in, uh, with love, with, with a total peace, you know, brother. So this is the, the, the natural status of, of, of a human life, you know. Yes. So, uh, and... Yeah, yeah. So, so Zionism, Zionism is uh, a poisonous, is a poisonous thought. It came to, uh, to, uh, to destroy this natural kind of life and natural, you know uh, Mohammed, as, as soon, of a human life yes brother yes and as, as as i think i hope people can see from our parts one and two on gaza's archaeology here one of the most important things in human life emerges from just telling that story the history of gaza's eclectic and cosmopolitan nature of its civilization that was always there right up until historical historic historical times, was functioning as a multi-ethnic society. And it, exactly. puts in, it, exactly. it puts in such great relief that for the majority, the vast majority of Gaza's territory, uh, time, and cultural history, that was the way it was, and mostly that way in Palestine. And now, again, we have a people who come in and say, and this is the official Israeli state now talking, the government they have just elected, that only Jewish people have an exclusive right. How small <laughs> does how small does that exclusive right to the land look compared yeah, with the yeah. enormity of Gaza's history? Yeah, brother, let me give you finally a, a, very, a, a very brief surprise. Yes. It's a, a total surprise. Yeah, I am sure it will surprise you. Uh, let me tell you that here in Gaza, since the old days, the biblical uh, the biblical era, right, right, the beginning of the twentieth century, here in Gaza we had a big and a large and a prominent Jewish community living inside Gaza. They mm -hmm. they they were they were a prominent part from. Uh, the society of Gaza. Yes. But 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 in the twenties in the twenties uh, of the last century, they were expelled from Gaza by the British, by the British administration, by the British mandate. They they expelled the Jews from Gaza, and they asked them to immigrate northward. To the, to the northern cities because they were uh, uh, afraid from the Arabs' reaction. Uh, 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 we, are, we are going to make a state for Jews uh, in Israel, so we have to, uh, to expel those Jews from Gaza because we know that if we uh, established Israel, uh, all the people of Gaza maybe they will make some uh, some violence some uh, re reaction against jews so people of gaza the arabs of gaza didn't expel 
their neighbors, the Jews, but they were expelled by the British uh, mandate administration. And we remember now, as we mentioned and, in the fines, and and, uh, and the brother, believe me, I I I, uh, I want to tell you that uh, British administration was mistaken in this uh, criminal action. If uh, Israel st stood as as a state in uh, 1948, I assure to you that the Arabs of Gaza will never harm any Jew, any Jew in Gaza. I, I, I insist to, to confirm this for you. So it's the it's the, 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 the crime of the British administration. And now we begin to realize the importance of a single object. We mentioned that it was not yet being allowed to be shown in the Gaza Archaeology Museum, but there was an oil lamp menorah, the symbol, the symbol of Jewish identity and nationhood and so forth. This was found in ancient ruins in Gaza. What a beautiful thing it would be to be able to show that, to show that Gaza welcomes all the people that want to live there, that have always lived there together. And that, well, that if you want legitimacy, you're not going to do it by outlawing the Palestinian flag, stealing their land, killing their people, on and on. That is not the road to legitimacy. Archaeology has been a major force for legitimacy for every nation state. We are ancient on this land, therefore we are a community and a nation and so forth. If you want legitimacy, you must pay attention to the facts. And the facts are what we can all see and hold in our hands. Gaza offers that to the world. And again, we can see how important the Gaza territory is to the human story. This must be restored through justice and peace. I think that's always been our message, Muhammad. Yes, brother. Gaza was uh, the home of so many Israeli and Jewish uh, prominent poets, uh, philosophers, scientists, scholars, etc. I will give you only two names, just uh, two names, and you can search about them. Uh, uh, Nathan, Nathan of Gaza, Nathan of Gaza, he is a very, very prominent philosopher. And uh, uh, Israel bin Moses Najara. He also he is a second poet and also he used to, uh, to search in philosophy. He was a philosopher and a poet. And Nathan of Gaza, who was a great philosophy. All of these people flourished in Gaza and lived in Gaza. And they used to uh, write book and to uh, improve their knowledge uh, in Gaza, inside Gaza. So Gaza, along the centuries, was uh, uh, a warm home, a warm home for the Jews. But unfortunately, before Nakba, with two decades, it was the uh, mistake of, of, of a British mandate who expelled, who expelled the Jews from Gaza. Yes. Uh, and it thank was, you, brother. Well, yeah. I just wanted to add that um, it's it's a great uplift for my heart and I think for yours to look at the ancient history and at the more recent history of your immediate ancestors who were living in Shafir and forced out of there at gunpoint. But it uh, it lifts the heart to think that even the ancient past is telling us what you've said already tonight that the great majority of Palestinian people do not want any kind of war or conflict or end to the state of Israel. No, that is false. It's a fact. The Palestinian people it's, want to live together as they always have. Yeah, I told you uh, during this meeting that uh, now we are living as prisoners, but I wanted to complete the sentence. Yes. Okay, we, we are living like prisoners, but unfortunately, right now, we doesn't uh, take the rights of, a pr of a prisoners. We haven't even the rights of a prisoners. Yes. And uh, there is a modern philosopher, I think it's not uh, Finkelstein, Norman Finkelstein, who asks the complimentary question, does a guard in a concentration camp have the right to self-defense? If you are imprisoning people for no good reason, 
enforcing their lack of freedom and causing their death and suffering. Do you have a right to self-defense while you do that? I don't exactly, think so. Exactly. I, I don't think yes, so. Me too, me too, me too. Yes, brother, you are right. Yeah. Yes. So with this, Mohammed, uh, maybe some of our viewers will write in their comments and questions and we can continue for you, as you said, many programs about the ancient and archeological history of Gaza, how important that is, how many threats there are to its continued existence and why it's another urgent aspect of the question that Palestinians must receive justice. This is not a threat to Israel. It is a promise of peace in a region of the world that should be thriving together. And that's our only hope. Anything you would like to add for today, Mohammed? I hope people will go to our blog at jackdempseywriter.wordpress.com, jackdempseywriter at wordpress.com, and check out the photos of the ongoing work on your home, Mohammed. Anything else you'd like to add today? Yes, brother. Uh, uh, we still have uh, so many unnarrated tales about Gaza history and Gaza ancient history, and I think we are going to narrate them uh, in the coming uh, meetings and coming episodes. Thank you so much for today, and please forgive me for my primitive, <laughs> primitive internet, primitive electricity, primitive everything. Well, if that is the case, <laughs> Mohammed, it is not your fault. None of this is needful. None of this, you're broadcasting from a prison on a battery with great beauty and great courage, as the Palestinian people do every day. So I hope our friends around the world will write their governments to end the policies that enforce the apartheid against you, and that they will remember too that there are ways that they can directly help the Palestinian people. If they just get in touch with us, we can help them do that. Thank you, my brother, and I look forward to our next meeting. Peace. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much.